Hi everyone. This is the last video in Unit 2 where we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, periodic trends. And this specifically relates to the quantum mechanical model and the electron configurations that we just finished. So we're going to look at trends in the atom and ion sizes, ionic ionization energy, chemical properties, and electronegativity. And so really we're here in terms of our outline, okay? Okay, why am I stuck? There we go. Now, the periodic table was originally constructed by Mendeleev. Um, it's interesting because in science, it's either publish or perish. That's what we say all the time. If you don't publish, you don't get funding, you can't do anything, you perish in the scientific field. And Mendeleev uh, actually gets credit for the periodic table. But what's interesting is within a month, uh, or I think it was two months, two guys both published a periodic table. And even though the second one was technically better, the first one gets credit. And so uh, we always say that Mendeleev created the periodic table. And he organized it by atomic number. He was able to take the missing periodic the missing elements from the periodic table and predict their properties, things that had not even been uh, discovered yet, which is a pretty big deal if you think about it. And so um, what ends up happening is the periodic table by organizing it with atomic number and then specifying, okay, we're going to end over here at... Uh, you know, P6 or with this column. We end up having it organized by the off bow principle and we end up getting some really nice properties including atomic radius, ionic radius, energy and reactivity. So when we talk about atomic radius, atomic radius is kind of hard to measure. If you think about how we defined an orbital, we said an orbital is just an area where you're 90 percent likely to find the electrons. So, name, so measuring an area, a probability area, is somewhat difficult. And so what they end up doing is instead of measuring uh, the exact orbitals that we're talking about because that's just not possible, what they do instead is they look at the relative areas between two neighboring nuclei. And so you have a nuclei and a nuclei of something that's bonded together. And if I did it right, this would have been touching. And they don't measure the electrons. They don't measure out here. What they do is they measure the distance between two nuclei and then cut it in half to find the atomic radius. Now, what's really cool is that the, period, the atomic radius increases down and to the left on the periodic table. Now it makes sense that it gets bigger as it goes down because 1s, 2s, 3s, you're adding energy levels as you go down. It seems kind of silly that the atomic radius is larger on the left than on the right until you consider one thing. When you're looking at adding protons to the nucleus and you start adding electrons, well the further out you get say like for the 3s here, we'll do sodium. There's only one electron here. So it's really hard for this nucleus to reach out and attract that electron in. Now as you go to magnesium, there's two. And so you can actually have two interactions. You go to um, aluminum, you have another one. You know, and you keep adding these electrons in the same energy level, you suddenly get more interactions between the nucleus and those electrons and it pulls them in. Okay, So when you're looking at this, just kind of remember that the atomic radius has absolutely nothing to do with atomic number. It has to do only with where the electrons are in the atom. Now just to kind of clarify, you cannot say, oh, well, lithium has more protons and more electrons than helium, so it's going to be, you know, bigger. 
that does not account for a big jump here and then a decline. It has to do with where the electrons are inside the atom. How many interactions are there between the nucleus and that valence electron or electrons? It has to do with those interactions and not atomic number. So if you look, here we've got the periodic table and the idea is you can't say um, anything about atomic size other than it increases to the left and down. So within the third period, which has got the largest atom. Now on the exam, what I would do is I would say given sodium, magnesium, aluminum, sulfur, chlorine, and argon, which has the largest atomic radius. And, um, and it would say radius, it wouldn't just say atom, uh, because you know you have to specify radius or mass. And so with that in mind, guys, um, because we would look for things on the left, sodium has the biggest atomic radius. If we were looking within the group one, the way that it would be worded is of the following atoms, which has the largest atomic radius. And I would give you something like uh, potassium, sodium, rubidium, cesium, and so on. Doing that, uh, you would be able to choose, okay, well, the one that's the biggest has the biggest radius is something like francium, okay? Now, with that in mind, let's go forward for a second. We can also look at ionic radius. Now, the ionic radius is a little bit different than the atomic radius. It's going to be measured the same way from neighboring atoms the difference here is going to be in uh, how many electrons and protons you have. And the remember, if you form a cation, it is going to be a positive charge by losing electrons. If it is an anion, it's going to be forming a negative charge by gaining electrons. Okay. So if you have a number of protons, doesn't even matter really, and you start adding them in, as you add in more electrons, there's too many to hold. Kind of think about, you know, trying to carry, if you play the game, can you carry all the grocery bags into the house at the same time in one trip? The more you load on, the bigger you get, the, the wider your radius is. On the other hand, so therefore um, anions or negatively charged ions are going to get larger. The more electrons you add, the bigger you get. On the other hand, cations have lost electrons. Now I always use my husband as an example here because it's a great example. Usually um, he doesn't know he does this. He doesn't mean to do it but he's very protective over his food. I don't know exactly why that is, but you know, he kind of sits over his, you know, you've got your plate, your fork, your knife, like that. And he's got, you know, chicken and potatoes and whatever. And what ends up happening as, is as he is like getting ready to eat, he sticks his elbows like here and here and leans over his food. Now, my, my daughters love to take food off of other people's plates. Um, it's a bad habit. We're trying to break it. But what will happen is, you know, this little girl will come over and be like, Daddy, Daddy, I want something to eat. And so, you know, he'll share. Even though she's already eaten, it's better because it's off his plate. So she'll take, you know, this and run away with it. Well, now his plate has fewer than what he it should have. He's lost those electrons or that potato or whatever it is. And he gets a little bit more protective. He like hunches in a little bit closer and makes his radius a little bit smaller. And I think it's just because, um, well, he likes his food. But so the, the idea is if you lose electrons, you get smaller. 
The more electrons you lose, the smaller you get. Let me yell at the dogs. Titan! Lay down, Titan. Okay, so what that really means for us is if we look at, this is the same series that we did the electron configuration of. And remember, this has got, uh-oh, okay, I just turned the volume up. This has got um, seven protons. Oops. Come on. There we go. Protons, electrons. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Gaining three means we have ten electrons. 8 plus 2 means 10 electrons, 9 plus 1 means 10, 10, 11 minus 1 is 10, 12 minus 2 is 10. So if you look at this, which is going to have the largest radius? And the idea is because you have way more electrons here than protons, the nucleus here cannot hold on to those. And so the largest is going to be N3. Here we've got so many protons, it's afraid of losing more. Kind of imagine like having to give up a cupcake or something. You're going to be more protective of what you have left. So Mg2 plus is going to be the smallest. Now, this is exactly how an, um, a multiple choice question could be worded. I'd give you the options and you'd have to find the largest or smallest. Now, ionization energy is the energy it takes to remove an electron from the gaseous state, from an ion, a, a, atom or ion in the gaseous state. First ionization energy means the energy it takes to remove one. Second ionization energy means you've already lost one, you're already in the positive charge, but now you're trying to lose a second one. Second ionization energy, second electron is coming off. You could keep doing this, third ionization energy and so on. The idea is as you increase well, let's do it this way. As you go from left to right, the ionization energy is going to increase. And it has to do with that same thing where as you add in electrons back here, you start getting more interactions. The more interactions you have, the harder it's going to be to rip this sucker off. Okay. Now, it's also going to be a little bit more difficult to remove things that are closer to you, closer to that nucleus, than it is things that are far away. So ionization energy increases as you move right and up. The closer you are and the more full your shells, the harder it is to remove that electron. Again, there's no correlation here with a uh, atomic number. Instead, it's only going to have to do with, um, what's it called, with... <laughs> where the electrons are in the atom. Now, you will notice there's some trends here and here where they don't quite follow in that nice linear path. And that has to do with ionization and uh, the ionization energy of things with paired electrons. So if you look at nitrogen, nitrogen electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, um, whereas um, if you look at oxygen, oxygen is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, 1, 2, 3, 4, oops, 1, 2, 3 orbitals for p, 2, 3, 4. And so you end up getting some repulsions here. So it's a little bit easier to take off an electron. It's like having to share your room with somebody that you really don't want to. It's a little easier to make that roommate leave because they didn't like to be there anyway. So the largest increase you're going to see in terms of ionization energy going up is when you get to those core electrons. When you're removing valence electrons, it's relatively easy to do it um, in, in comparison. On the other hand, it is going to be very difficult to remove inner ones. So if you look at potassium, potassium has the electron configuration argon 4s1. So you can take that one off pretty easily. But to try, try and go into that third 
energy level, the core electrons, you get a huge jump. I mean, this is a jump of like eight times, eightfold. For calcium, calcium is argon 4s2. So to remove the first electron takes a little energy. To remove the second electron takes a little bit more energy. To go into those core electrons, you get a huge jump. That's fivefold right there. And same thing. And so you can kind of see the trend here is as you uh, go into those core electrons, you get a huge jump. So within the third period, which one has the largest ionization energy? And within group one, which has the largest ionization energy? I like the one that doesn't have stuff written on it. Okay, so third period, one, two, three. Sodium, magnesium, all the way to argon. Ionization energy increases to the right and up. So argon is going to have uh, the highest here. Now, if we look within group one, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, francium, highest up is hydrogen. So hydrogen should have the highest ionization energy there. And we can always confirm that. But I'm not going to try and trip you. I mean, it's it's just if you follow the trend, you're going to be right. So which has the largest second ionization energy, sodium or magnesium? Now, sodium has 11 protons. Magnesium has 12. Sodium is neon, 3s1. Magnesium is neon, 3s2. So first ionization energy takes us down to neon. This is for Na+. And for Mg+, you get neon 3s1 is left. And so at this point, sodium is down to its core electrons. And so even though the first ionization energy would be the largest with magnesium, the second ionization energy is much higher with sodium. There you go. Now, in terms of electron affinity, electron affinity is um, really the exact opposite of ionization energy. Here, it's the energy change associated with adding an electron to an atom in the gaseous state. Now, here we just talk about it in terms of being more negative, with negative being good. It wants to be negative. And so the most negative is fluorine. So it becomes more negative as you go up and to the right. Fluorine wants electrons more than anyone else. And if you kind of look, he's got nine protons. He's so close to neon. Whereas something like chlorine that has 17, 17 to 18, it's, eh, it's a minor difference. I mean, yeah, you want it, but not as bad, okay? So oxygen, fluorine, and sulfur, according to increasing ionization energy and atomic size. Now, on the periodic table, this is how they look, okay? So if we look at ionization energy, I hope you guys are pausing for all these application quizzes so you can really try them on your own. That is going to benefit you in the long run. If you're not doing that, you're really not setting yourself up for, for success on the exam. So ionization energy increases to the right and up. So fluorine would be the highest. Down and left is the smallest, so sulfur should be the smallest and oxygen is going to be in the middle. Atomic size, the bigger you are, um, or atoms get bigger as they move left and down. So the biggest atom should be sulfur. Fluorine is up and to the right, so that should be the smallest. And again, oxygen is in the middle. Now technically on the exam, I like to do things all in a period or all in a group. Group one, period three. Um, with multiple choice options. I don't like to give you more than one column, more than one row, but this is a good example, so yay. So remember guys, that it is the valence electrons that determine 
and atoms chemistry and properties. Is it going to react? Is it not going to react? Is it going to form an anion or a cation? Is it going to do specific things as we get into reactions? There are so many things that we can really look at and so I just want you to kind of remember it's those valence electrons, the electron configuration that determines so much. Now also kind of go through practice electron configurations until you are sick of them, until you get them just by looking, okay? Um, you can should be able to find them just by looking at the periodic table, uh, but if not, keep practicing. It'll come.